on how many high containment labs exist in the United States and how many do we really need. Number two, how many labs had serious accidents in which lab workers or the public could have been exposed to dangerous diseases? Three, how effective are the high containment labs personnel reliability measures and inventory technology? What changes have been made to address the Department of Justice conclusion that a single Department of Defense employee caused the anthrax attacks of 2001? We asked the Government Accountability Office, GAO, to look into these issues, and today we will learn what they found. Unfortunately, many problems still exist, such as no single agency or office in the federal government keeps track of how many high containment labs there are in the United States, where they're located, what types of research they are doing, and whether they are safe and secure. In short, there still appears to be no adequate federal plan or effort to manage, much less coordinate, highly dangerous research. There are no universal standards for lab design, construction, or use. The Department of Health and Human Services publishes a guideline, Biosafety in the Biomedical and Microbiological Laboratories, known as the BMBL. Labs that receive NIH grants must comply with BMBL guidelines, but private and other non-federally funded research facilities have no similar requirement. While labs that handle select agents must obtain federal registration and, cert and cert cert certification, no accreditation or certification is required for labs working with dangerous organi organisms that are not on the select agent list, such as SARS or West Nile virus. There are no standards for biosafety training or the credentialing of high containment laboratory workers. The Department of Health and Human Services only requires training of workers handling organisms on the select agent list. There are no standards or mechanisms for ensuring involuntary control or personal, personnel reliability. It is essential to lab security that lab workers undergo adequate screening and that the quantity of biological agents in a lab is tracked carefully. Failures in personnel reliability practices can be catastrophic. Again, the 2001 anthrax tax, which the Department of Justice has said was the work of one Department of Defense scientist, is a tragic example of this risk. Finally, the biolab community has no mechanism to catalog accidents and mishaps for collective analysis so lessons can be learned and shared to improve safety and security practices. Unfortunately, what is clear is that the federal policy on biosafety and security remains basically unchanged from what it was when we had our hearing two years ago. There is hope that this may change thanks to two reports that should be finalized, hopefully, in the next coming weeks. The first is the Trans-Federal Task Force on Optimizing Biosafety and Biocontainment Oversight, which is co-chaired by HHS and USDA, which was a direct result of our hearing two years ago. The task force report will make important recommendations for improving biosafety in the United States. Another such study by the Executive Working, excuse me, by the Executive Order Working Group on Strengthening the Biosecurity of the United States, which was created by President Bush's executive order in January, will make recommendations on ways to improve the select agent program. The committee staff has been briefed about the process for preparing these reports, and it is hoped that these reports will be available in the next few weeks. I look forward to hearing from the administration on this important matter at that time. Today we will hear testimony from the Government Accountability Office about its findings and recommendations concerning biolab safety and security. Their report, titled High Containment Laboratories, National Strategy for Oversight is Needed, was released yesterday. We will also hear from a representative of the American Society of Microbiology who can share the perspective of those who operate and work directly with high containment labs. I look forward to hearing testimony of our witnesses regarding how we can quickly and responsibly address this challenge and enhance our nation's biosafety and security. It is our hope that this new administration will act quickly to improve data about labs and improve lab safety and security. Let me also express my condolences to the families and co-workers and friends of the University of Chicago professor, Malcolm Kashadaban, who died last week from, a weird, what, from what appears to be an infection that he may have acquired from the lab while doing research on the plague. This highlights the fact that even more needs to be done to, done to protect our scientists and the public inside and outside the lab. 
With that, uh, I'll next turn to a gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, please, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Stupak, and I appreciate the opportunity to join you at this hearing today. I concur with your remarks and sympathies to the uh, family of Malcolm Kasadaban. Um, and it, I think it's important to note that that was a, a level two lab. Uh, we're dealing with level three and four in this hearing today, but it does raise the issue about how, how far down we need to go. And in this case, I guess they're still trying to figure out if the bacteria, uh, Yersinia, uh, that persisted in his blood uh, that's related to uh, the plague perhaps caused uh, his death. And so clearly we need to be investigating these uh, uh, safety issues in, in all of our country's labs. I also say, Mr. Chairman, that um, the Republican staff has come to learn that the NIH, as part of their stimulus dollars now, may have received upwards of a billion dollars to more rapidly build out these labs, which I think raises the issue about our need to do proper oversight, not only of how stimulus dollars are being spent here, but elsewhere throughout the government so that the taxpayers' money is uh, spent uh, appropriately. And so I would hope that our subcommittee would have a hearing on stimulus spending as it relates to the agencies under our purview. Yesterday, the Government Accountability Office released a report addressing some of the issues raised at our previous hearing regarding increased oversight and improved safety measures at these uh, types of laboratories, and they're here today to discuss their findings, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, just weeks after 9-11, our nation faced a series of bioterrorist attacks where weapons-grade anthrax was delivered through the mail, and five people died. Authorities now believe the one scientist who worked in one of our nation's high containment laboratories was uh, responsible for those attacks. Uh, my office was in the Longworth building in those days, and uh, we were shut out of our office because of the anthrax that came into that building. In response to the attacks, Congress increased funding to upgrade our nation's biodefense program. The National Institutes of Health, NIH, which fund much of the lab research and construction, spent $1.7 billion in 2007 compared to 53 million on biodefense labs in 2001. Now that's a 32-fold increase in spending. Again, we understand that NIH is receiving stimulus dollars to uh, add another billion dollars in spending uh, for uh, intramural, uh, extramural facilities, and I think it would be important to know just how that money is being spent. Especially with such a steep increase in funding and rapid expansion of the lab network, it is time to re-examine the federal regulatory system to ensure safety and efficiency. Our hearing on October 4th of 2007 examined the results of the Bioterrorism Act on federal oversight of select agents. It identified a few gaps and questioned how these labs and federal regulations would mitigate risk while increasing our defenses. Now, it's been almost two years since our last hearing, and it is evident both the federal government and the academic realm agreed with the sense of the subcommittee's hearing that there is a need for increased oversight and improved safety and security measures in high containment laboratories. As a result of the October 2007 hearing, the Trans-Federal Task Force on Optimizing Biosafety and Biocontainment Oversight was created. That's co-chaired by HHS and USDA, and their report, along with recommendations to improve oversight and safety, is scheduled to be released within the next week or two. In January, then-President Bush, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, signed Executive Order 13486, which established the working group to examine how to strengthen uh, laboratory biosecurity and safety in our nation's high containment labs. Now, the working group's report was completed and sent to the President in July. Yet to date, the administration has not publicly commented on, nor released the report, nor made any formal recommendations. Committee staff was told the administration has begun to collect and evaluate these reports and is in the preliminary stages of the policy process, yet a request for a briefing or a witness for the hearing from the White House was unanswered. GAO's report highlights the pressing need for coordinated national oversight of our nation's high containment laboratories. GAO recommends the National Security Advisor name a single entity charged with government-wide strategic evaluation of high containment laboratories, including tracking our lab capacity, evaluating our country's needs, and establishing our research priorities. There seems to be some consensus within the scientific community that we already have oversight infrastructures in place within the Departments of Health and Human Services and the Department of Agriculture. I hope the administration utilizes this existing expertise instead of creating a centrally located biosafety, or shall we call it a germ czar, at the White House. 
Other reports completed by the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity were issued earlier this year. These reports discuss ways to increase safety and security in our nation's high containment labs, focusing on personnel reliability and enhancing training programs. A lot of research and reports have been completed by our government and academic associations, and we're appreciative of those. But some of these reports have not been finalized and made public. In turn, only Dr. Kingsbury from the GAO is here to discuss their report, which we appreciate, and answer our questions. But these facts suggest to me that this committee might have been better served by delaying this hearing for a week or two until we could have all the reports before us before they were released and various responsible federal agencies could also send witnesses to give us a more complete view of what we face. The oversight of our nation's high containment laboratories is an issue that is deserving of this subcommittee's attention. However, this hearing is not inclusive, I believe, or representative of all the work that's been done in this area, and we need to keep that in mind as we proceed. I do want to welcome Dr. Atlas from the American Society of Microbiology, which has more than 40,000 members. We appreciate your being here representing the scientists and health professionals who staff these labs. Your, your input will be very valuable. He'll discuss the important roles these laboratories play in protecting our nation, the importance of biosafety requirements for the labs and its personnel, and recommendations to improve biosafety training, oversight, resources, reporting, and biosecurity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Look forward to working with you on this issue in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Uh, Ms. Christensen, opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to you and Mr. Walden. I really appreciate the opportunity to take the second look at the oversight or lack of oversight on high containment biolabs. I recall from my time on the Committee on Homeland Security when the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease testified that they were in the process of building their two laboratories, and I'm amazed to see how the number has grown in the public, academic, and private sectors. But I'm very concerned that this as I'm sure are you, that there's no one agency that can tell us how many of these labs there are, and that some of the same uncertainties about what is exposure, how best to train and certify employees still exist. Not much seems to have changed since the 2007 report and hearing. We all realize that we have to balance stimulating and supporting research with providing regulatory oversight, but the fulcrum really has to be the safety of the employees, the surrounding communities, and our country. I look forward to the testimonies. I thank Dr. Kingsbury and Dr. Atlas for being here today. Thank you. Mr. Green, opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing on the federal oversight of the high containment biolabs in the U.S. This hearing is a follow-up one held by our committee in 2007. I look forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses today on the federal oversight of the safety systems of these bio labs and how we can improve our evaluation and tracking system. In Texas, the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston's National Lab is one of the two national biocontainment laboratories constructed under grants awarded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease um, the National Institute of Health. And I'm proud to have much of this research being performed literally in the backyard at UTMB in Galveston. At this BSL-4 lab, research is conducted to develop therapies and vaccines and tests for diseases like anthrax, avian influenza, bubonic plague, uh, Ebola, typhus, West Nile virus, influenza, and drug-resistant tuberculosis. As a nation, we need this work performed. During my visits to the UTMB, I learned firsthand about the measures there. the UTMB is taking to ensure that lab is built with every contingency in mind, and I also learned about the comprehensive training program the UTMB has in place. I had a personal interest in the safety at BioLabs. My daughter completed her fellowship in infectious disease at UTMB, and she worked some of the research conducted on the select agents at the operational BSL-4 and in that Galveston National Lab when it was completed. Due to the damage to the UTMB campus from Hurricane Ike, she unfortunately, like many researchers, left Galveston, and now she's in University of, Nebraska, University of Nebraska, it's hard for me to say that, from Texas, working in infectious diseases. But I also know that during Hurricane Ike, uh, that lab was the safest place to be on Galveston Island. There was no loss, uh, uh, no exposure, and uh, just a uh, success on what had been done for a number of years, and uh, to see it even grow even more. Uh, it withstood a Category 4 hurricane, on a barrier island, so I think it's built pretty well. 
as a parent to a researcher, I'm, I want to make sure that these biosafety labs adhere to the highest safety training standards wherever they may be, and it was a source of personal comfort that UTMB had placed such an emphasis on safety training. And I'd hope that we ensure the safety of these labs across the U.S. Given the growth in these labs nationwide, I think we need to step up our safety training efforts as well as a structure within the existing agency, such as HHS or Department of Agriculture, to track the growth of these labs. And again, I appreciate the witnesses here today. And I, my other hat, I serve on the health subcommittee. And a lot of those illnesses that uh, these bio labs are working on are ones that we hope to be able to. Uh, we hope they'll never have to treat our constituents, but we also know in this world they may have to. So we need those labs there doing their job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, for other members, I know. Um, Chairman Waxman and others have submitted opening statements. Uh, members of the subcommittee, their statement will be made part of record. That concludes the opening statement by members of the committee. I now call our panel of witnesses. On our panel, we have Dr. Nancy Kingsbury, who is the Managing Director of Applied Research and Methods at the Government Accountability Office, and Dr. Sushil Sharma with the GAO, and Dr. Ronald Atlas, who is the co-chair of the Committee on Biodefense at the American Society of Microbiology. Welcome to our witnesses. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have a right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be rep represented by counsel? Everyone's indicating no. All right, then I'm going to ask you, please rise, raise your right hand, take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, and matter pending before this committee? Yes, Let the record reflect the witnesses replied in the affirmative. You are now under oath. We will hear a five-minute opening statement from our witnesses. You may also submit a longer statement for the record, and it would be included in the hearing record. Uh, Dr. Kingsbury, would you like to start, please? Sure. Thank you very much. Do I have to turn there? Is that on now? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we're very pleased to be here to discuss our report on a national strategy for high containment laboratories in the United States that deal with dangerous pathogens. Uh, our report on those matters uh, was released yesterday, as you mentioned in your opening statements. Uh, such high containment laboratories have proliferated in recent years. This report focuses on the proliferation in the U.S., but similar things are done uh, in other countries. In 2007, we reported on several issues associated with the proliferation of these labs in the United States and some of the risks posed by biosafety incidents that occurred in the past. The FBI's allegation in August 2008 that a DOD scientist was the sole perpetrator of the 2001 anthrax attacks raised additional concerns about the possibilities of insider misuse of high containment lab facilities, materials, and technology. Highly publicized Laboratory errors and controversies about where high containment labs should be located have raised questions about whether the governing framework, oversight, and standards for biosafety and biosecurity are adequate. In this context, you asked us to address the following questions. To what extent and in what areas has the number of high containment labs increased in the United States? Which federal agency is responsible for tracking the expansion of high containment laboratories and determining the associated aggregated risks? And what lessons can be learned from highly publicized incidents at high containment laboratories and actions taken by the regulatory agencies? We have three basic findings to report. First, since 2001, the number of BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs in the United States has increased, and this expansion has taken place across federal, state, academic, and private sectors. Information about the number, location, activities, and ownership is available for high containment laboratories that are registered with CDC's or USDA's select agent programs, but not for those outside those programs. The expansion that began after the anthrax attacks in 2001 lacked a clear coordinated national strategy. Decisions to fund construction of high containment labs were made by multiple federal agencies in multiple budget cycles. Federal and state agencies, academia, and the private sector considered their individual requirements, but an assessment of national need was lacking. Even now, after more than seven years, we were unable to find any projections based on a government-initiated strategic evaluation of current and future capacity requirements linked to national public health goals. Such information is needed, we think, to ensure that the U.S. will have facilities in the right place with the right research capabilities. Second, no executive or legislative mandate directs any single federal agency to track the expansion of all high containment labs. 
Accordingly, no federal agency knows how many such lab exists in the United States, and no single agency is responsible for determining or able to determine the aggregate risks associated with the expansion of these labs. Consequently, no federal agency can determine whether high containment lab capacity is now less than, meets, or exceeds the national need. Finally, four highly publicized biosafety incidents in high containment labs, as well as evidence in the scientific literature, demonstrate that while laboratory accidents are rare, they do occur primarily due to human error or systems failures. One of the incidents we reviewed involved the allegations that Dr. Bruce Ivins of DOD was the source of the 2001 anthrax attack. These allegations highlighted two lessons. First, an ill-intentioned insider could pose a risk by removing dangerous material from a high containment lab. And second, it is impossible to have 100% effective inventory control of biological material with currently available technologies. Such inventory control is possible for nuclear material and for chemical material, but because biological material grows and expands, um, there are no, currently no uh, available technologies. At Fort Detrick, ineffective procedures for the control of inventories and the unrestricted use of lab facilities allegedly allowed Dr. Ivins the opportunity to pursue his own ends. As the number of high containment labs increases, there will inevitably be an increase in the pool of scientists with expertise, and thus the corresponding risk from insiders is likely to increase. Taken as a whole, these incidents we review demonstrate failure of systems and procedures meant to maintain biosafety in high containment labs. They reveal the failure to comply with regulatory requirements, safety measures that were not commensurate with the level of risk to public health posed by the lab workers and the pathogens in the lab, and the failure to fund ongoing facility maintenance and monitor the operational effectiveness of lab physical infrastructure. In conclusion, I want to stress that, that oversight plays a critical role in improving biosafety and ensuring that high containment labs comply with regulations. However, some aspects of the current oversight programs provided by the CDC and USDA are dependent upon entities monitoring themselves and reporting incidents to federal regulators. Furthermore, personnel reliability programs have been established since 2001 to counter insider risks, but their cost, effectiveness, and programmatic impact has not been evaluated. If an agency were tasked or a mechanism were established with the purpose of overseeing the expansion of high containment labs, it could develop a strategic plan to ensure the number and capabilities of potentially dangerous high containment labs are no greater or less than necessary. It could balance the risks and benefits of expanding such labs, and it could determine the type of oversight needed. To address these issues, we recommended that the National Security Advisor, in consultation with the Secretaries of Health and Human Services, Agriculture, Defense, and Homeland Security, and the National Intelligence Council, and any other departments and agencies that are appropriate, identify a single entity charged with periodic strategic evaluation of high containment labs that will determine the number, location, and mission of the laboratories needed to effectively meet national goals to counter bio threats. The existing laboratory capacity within the United States, the aggregate risks associated with the laboratory's expansion, and the type of oversight needed. It could also develop in consultation with the scientific community national standards for the design, construction, commissioning, and operation of high containment laboratories, specifically including provisions for long-term maintenance, which is an area that we're quite concerned about. Um, we also recommended that the secretaries of Health and Human Services and Agriculture de develop a clear definition of exposure to select agents. Some of these incidents suggest that there is some confusion in that regard and a mechanism for sharing lessons learned from reported laboratory accidents so that best practices for other operators of high containment laboratories can be identified and distributed. Recognizing that biological inventories cannot be completely controlled at present, we also recommended that the secretaries of HHS and Agriculture review existing inventory control systems and invest in and develop appropriate technologies to minimize the potential for insider misuse of biological agents. Finally, should the secretaries consider implementing a more stringent personnel reliability program for high containment laboratories employees to deal with insider risk, we recommended that they evaluate and document the cost, effectiveness, and programmatic impact of such a program. We did obtain written comments on a draft of, uh, the draft of our report from the secretaries of Health and Human Services and Agriculture. Um, HHS and Agriculture con con concurred with our recommendations that were directed to them. Uh, the Executive Office of the President and the National Security Council did not provide any comments. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you or your colleagues may have. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharma, were you going to make an opening statement? No. 
Okay. Uh, Dr. Atlas, opening statement, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the American Society for Microbiology. When I began my career 40 years ago, we thought we had conquered infectious disease, but in fact that is not the case. Uh, we have newly emerging infectious diseases every year, whether it's SARS or multi-drug and extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis or the current outbreak of the H1N1 influenza. And these outbreaks of disease uh, have not only public health, but also economic and political repercussions. And therefore, we need to carry out research to find the therapeutics, vaccines, diagnostics, and other ways of coping with these diseases. In other words, we must continue to perform research on pathogenic microorganisms. And much of that research needs to be performed in high containment laboratories where the safety of the scientists working on the organisms as well as the public can be protected. These are not weapons laboratories. Rather, they are research laboratories where investigations are carried out with the aim of protecting public health. Inevitably, as we've seen in the tragic case in Chicago, at least from the reports, there is risk uh, to the scientists and perhaps to the community when we work with these organisms. And accordingly, the American Society for Microbiology has strongly supported responsible regulation, oversight, practices, and guidelines that improve laboratory biosafety and protect laboratory personnel, the public, and the efficacious performance of the research that leads to the vaccines, therapeutic drugs, and diagnostics that we need. And over the years, we have reached a balance, at least for the moment, between the safety practices that are carried out in the laboratory and the ability to perform research. Although these procedures, when properly followed, uh, do provide a level of safety to the workers in the community, the ASM feels that we continuously need to review these practices and to find new and better ways to move forward. Uh, during the past two years, the ASM has met with the Transfederal Task Force on Biosafety and Biocontainment Oversight and the Executive Order Working Group on Strengthening the Biosecurity of the United States and made a number of recommendations to those groups. Um, clearly, there is a need to ensure adequate training and strict compliance to provide the levels of protection engendered in existing biosafety procedures as well as those that may be proposed. The ASM has made a number of recommendations which I would like to summarize for you. First, the Biosafety and Microbiological and Biomedical Laboratories Manual, or the BMBL, which contains the core guidelines for the safe operation of all microbiological laboratories, should be the subject of regular biennial review and update as needed. The BMBL, along with the NIH guidelines for recombinant DNA research, are essential reference documents we need to continuously examine these, update them, and provide more guidance for the community and to develop specific competencies for biosafety training and recommended procedures for incident reporting. The ASM view is that the CDC, NIH, and USDA should take the lead for BMBL revisions, but that there also should be a broad advisory input from the community. Second, the list of pathogens designated as select agents and those requiring BSL-3 and BSL-4 containment should be regularly updated. And again, we would urge that a scientific community that is broadly based help to guide the development of these lists. Third, there should be mandated training and performance requirements for biosafety personnel overseeing the safety of high containment laboratories. And again, the NIH and CDC should make educational training programs available, and we should continuously look to the standards that need to be achieved. Fourth, the select agent regulation should be revised to change the requirements for inventory of vials and select agents. Laboratories should be accountable for which agents they possess and where these agents are located but counting of vials that are in a freezer when we're dealing with live organisms provides a false sense of security and does not really help in protecting the nation. Fifth, the NIH requirements that foreign institutions must have comparable facilities and standards to the U.S. collaborators should be changed to remove hurdles for international collaboration. We've been struck by the UTMB experience 
where they no longer can get strains of hemorrhagic fever viruses into the United States because the laboratories overseas that in fact are holding those organisms may not meet U.S. standards. Six, the Congress should enhance funding as needed to ensure the upkeep of the high containment laboratories. Now that many of these laboratories have been constructed, they should be concerned that they continue to meet the high standards to which they were built. Seven, we need an improved system for surveillance and reporting of laboratory acquired illnesses. This should be done in a way where we learn lessons from incidents which unfortunately occur rather than trying to hide these incidents for fear of recrimination. And finally, um, we should be examining very carefully the costs and benefits of potential accreditation system. Um, in this regard, uh, we see the current select agent regulations as providing a pseudo-accreditation. There are standards, there are inspections. As has been pointed out, this does not exist for the non-select agents, and I think we need to examine the potential value of moving forward. We would note that the American Biological Safety Organization, APSA, um, is in fact in the process of developing a voluntary accreditation system. I think we need to look at that, but moreover, we really need to develop the standards, look to what we need to hold the labs accountable for, and have a system in place where we can assure this committee and the nation that we are complying. Um, in conclusion, I think we've made tremendous strides over the past years in moving towards meeting the needs of the nation, both in terms of the research and the safety. More needs to be done. Um, we need to do this carefully and in a considered way so that we don't upset an apple cart and put the nation at risk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, and thank you both for your testimony. We'll go to questions. Um, one of the things we've learned from our oversight hearings is that there's no federal agency in charge of the expansion of the high containment biolabs. I think the average citizen would be surprised to learn or shocked to learn that the government doesn't even know how many bios, BSL lab, BSL3 labs there are in the United States. On Table 3 from the GAO report, uh, you might want to put up on a monitor, it should be number 3 there, we see that the number of BSL4 labs has increased even since 2007 when we held our first hearing, there are now two more BSL-4 labs that are fully operational in the United States since our 2007 hearing. There are also seven more BSL-4 labs currently under construction. So if we go back and we look at your figure one um, in the GO report and figure one on our monitor, we can see the locations of the BSL-4 labs are being built right now across the United States. When these labs become operational, we will have doubled the BSL-4 capacity in the United States without any federal agency analyzing whether this is appropriate needs for a country. And then if we look at figure two in the GAO report, uh, we can see that the number of BSL-3 labs has continued to increase in the same period of time. Table four shows there are about 1,400 BSL-3 labs in the United States. And these are only the BSL-3 labs registered with the federal government. We can only guess how many there are out there because they don't have to register unless it's handling one of those select agents. So, Dr. Kingsbury, let me ask you, do you have any concerns about the increase we've seen in the number of high containment labs? Yes, sir. Could, could you explain your concerns and get around your mic, please? Oh, sorry. I said yes. Um, well, the, the concern is there may be a need for this number of laboratories, but nobody is looking at the total picture. Nobody is looking at um, what the public health and public safety research needs are uh, and linking that to where labs are built and, and how many of them we need. Um, and if, um, if you look at the, co the combination of Table 4 and Table 5, right. which is the labs that are registered with APHIS you know, at the Department of Agriculture, you end up with... Uh, more than 1,600 uh, BSL-3 labs out there. That just seems like a lot. And, and when you mentioned the uh, Department of Ag, uh, Dr. Atlas, in, in your report and your letter you sent after our last hearing, it was recently updated in July. Uh, were you the author of that letter, or, or was there a team of you that did that? Um, we so, have a team that. Okay. 
You mentioned about because uh, of APHIS and, and Department of Ag there because 75 percent of the new infectious diseases we're seeing actually comes from animals passed to humans. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, Dr. Atlas, do you have any concerns about this increased number of labs we're seeing? I don't think I have the same sort of concern that is expressed in the GAO report um, because I see these labs as safe labs. If, if you tell me that we're creating more safe infrastructure within the nation where research can be performed, uh, that's something that I support. And so it, from that sense, uh, no, I don't have the same concern in terms of safety when you tell me it is a safer laboratory structure. Now, is it more safe than we need? I guess I don't see things that way. If, uh, let me ask you this question. In, in your October 4th letter, and again, it was updated in, in July of this year for this hearing, it says on, on the second page, it said, facilities at BS, BSL 3 and 4 levels of containment have been construction, constructed because the number and capacity of existing biocontainment facilities were determined to be inadequate to meet the needs for biodefense and emerging disease work. What is the right number then? What is the right number we need of level three and level four labs? I don't know the right number overall. Um, certainly there was an assessment done at the National Institutes of Health that suggested we needed something of the order of 10 to 15 regional laboratories to cover the nation that would uh, provide uh, core resources for the research and potential surge capacity if we had a major outbreak. Um, beyond that, uh, there a number of institutions have seen the need or desirability to have small laboratories where they could do research on agents in a safe manner. But, but my concern is, and I think Dr. Kingsbury pointed out, that unlike, let's say, nuclear material with these agents, they're always growing, so always expanding. And in looking at the GL report, and, and even your uh, report or, or your testimony, one of the biggest errors we have is human error, and it just comes inherent with the job. And, and like nuclear, we try to contain it. We try to have less... Uh, people handling it, less chance of error. Doesn't the same logic hold true here? The more labs you have, the more scientists and researchers you have handling this, the more likely of a disaster, not just within the lab, but escaping outside the labs. Not if we have the appropriate safety standards, and I think that's where we would put our emphasis on increasing the training and the resources to ensure that all the workers in the laboratory are performing safely. I think it's important. Sure, but there, there really is no safety. It's on-the-job training, isn't it? If I'm a researcher, it's basically I don't go to some school to learn how to do this. This are is on-the-job. There are safety courses that are offered, um, but again. But not they, required. They're not required. And therefore, you are correct that much of the uh, training is on the job. I think what the ASM would propose is that we, in fact, move to a system with national standards that would establish minimum guidelines for the training and that we provide the resources where we can assure this committee that anyone who's walking into a laboratory where dangerous agents are contained is adequately trained and further that we instill in the community a culture of responsibility with a zero tolerance what? for not following the procedures. Sure. Let me ask you this. If you go back to figure number three, that, that we had up, and, and it's in the GO report, it's there, figure number two, where you went from about 400 BSL labs in 2004 to almost 1,400 in 2008. Um, can you find that chart? The, the, the question I want to ask, if, no, back one. No, I want to go this one right here, BSL3. This one here at the line coming, there you go. That's 2004, and we go up to almost 1,400. Were these labs always in existence, and they never reported the select agents they're dealing with? Um, I mean, how, how do you? That's probably true. Um, what this graph represents is the number of laboratories, I believe, registered for work with um, select agents. It does not necessarily represent the construction of new 
No, I know that. Laboratories. I can be a university. I might have many labs within within my university structure. But I guess I'm just trying to explain how do you go from 400. If you're supposed to be registered before, are there that much more interest in these 80 select agents? Or have they always been doing the work and we never knew about it, which once again shows no coordination or no one's in charge here? You know, in post-2002, um, the nation has made a significant investment. Christ, the Bio Bioterror Act of 2002. Bioterrorist-related or potentially related organisms. That has brought a great deal, as, as pointed out, we went from a very small uh, budget to a $1.7 billion sort of investment in research that, that was largely in the research to be con conducted rather than construction of new laboratories. And that has led to a number of individuals joining in the effort to develop vaccines against Ebola or anthrax and the other diseases to protect the nation about what is now seen as a new threat from the misuse of biological weapons. So it's sort of like what Mr. Walden said, we put the money out there and suddenly everyone became BSL-3 labs to do research. Uh, they followed the money, not necessarily the threat. Um, I didn't say that. Well, I know you didn't say that. I was, I'm summarizing you. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't my You point. went from 53 million to 1.7 billion, right. I think you brought out. Certainly, and it almost seems like we throw money out there, suddenly we're all BSL-3 or 4 labs. Well, certainly when I testified before the Congress in the 2002 era, there was a perception that we had a tremendous threat facing us, and we had to combat that threat by racing to develop right. stockpiles of vaccines and therapeutics that could be uh, – moved across the nation. We needed better vaccines. When we looked at some of the ones we had, we decided they weren't safe enough. The smallpox vaccine that we had, you and I once used, we weren't going to give to our children. We wanted something safer than that. We called upon National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease to move forward with that. And uh, in fact, there's been a tremendous investment that has been brought forth with congressional support and fervor because the Congress was very worried about these diseases and the community has responded by trying to perform the needed research and that has led to an expansion. Okay. Mr. Walden, questions please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have the, I think, dubious honor of representing the large, the area with the largest biological attack in U.S. soil. When the Bhagran Shri Rajneesh set up encampment in southern Wasco County outside the town of Antelope, they concocted a little mixture that they then spread in the salad bars in the city of the Dalles and poisoned hundreds of people. It took the federal government more than a year to admit that it was actually a biological attack, this salmonella uh, strain that they spread. So uh, I take this issue real seriously and realize there is a threat that if, if uh, the folks in that encampment could pull it off, uh, it could happen by a serious terrorist somewhere. Do you think there's still a pretty good threat against the country? I mean, we understand that there is a threat of criminal activity and of terrorism and that we need to be vigilant. Uh, from the community's perspective, mm -hmm. we need to develop a true taboo against the use of biological weapons. It is right. a zero tolerance, nowhere, no how, no one, which also suggests that the community must be your eyes and ears and that we need a system whereby the community can responsibly report any suspicious uh, activities that might represent misuse, um, and that the community has zero tolerance for a lack of adherence to the biosafety procedures. So, so Dr. Atlas, that's a very, uh, I think, a very salient point. Uh, is there such a system in place where scientists who observe something they believe to be inappropriate can effectively communicate that to somebody that can do something about it and at least check? I don't think we have a, an adequate coordinated system uh, of knowing who to call other than your local FBI office, which may not um, have the ability to adequately understand the information. Um, Got Dr. So Kings. We, we certainly, the American Society for Microbiology has, has put forth and, and is putting forth every day to our members a code of ethics that calls upon them to only use the science for the betterment of humankind and sure. to report to appropriate authorities um, any potential misuse of the science. D Dr. Kingsbury, I, I haven't had a chance to thoroughly go through your report, but did you look at those issues at the GAO? The, the issues of 
you're talking about the, the outbreak in Oregon or? No, I'm sorry. I moved off that into what Dr. Allis was suggesting, that there isn't a really good reporting mechanism for scientists to feed in observances of, of uh, misuse of some of these agents. There is, there is really not in, in any of the uh, programs that we see. Um, Did you review that in the course of your uh, investigation, though, that issue? We, you want to? Yes, we looked at in context of the Department of Defense and Department of Energy, which mm -hmm. do have a personnel reliability program. Uh, even in those highly intrusive programs, there is no mechanism whereby a coworker can report on his coworker uh, if they. Do you make recommendations in your report about such a system? Uh, we made a recommendation that. The Secretary of HHS and Agriculture, <clears throat> if they decide to implement this uh, as a way to uh, mitigate the insider risk, that they should consider the cost uh, and impact of this program. Now, let me just say, within the Department of Defense, we talked to a number of scientists who are working in BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs, and they all unanimously said that a determined scientist despite the intrusive nature of the PRP program, as they're called, can easily take the material out. There is nothing there that can stop a determined scientist. So in other words, there's nothing we can do to stop a mad scientist at, from taking the pathogens point. out and doing evil things with them. Okay. No law in the books is going to stop given, them. No. I mean, we already have laws against doing what some of Exa these people might do. So uh, what about, harm people, so is, is there a way to do some sort of pre-security clearance? I mean, I don't, I don't want to bog down our whole research system. Well, that's, but, that's what a personnel, a more stringent personnel security program mm -hmm. would probably require. There's a cost to that. And the whole basis for our, argue, our right. concern about the growth of the number of laboratories is grounded in the fact that this federal government needs to make some hard choices about cost. And so you can't do that if you're not doing an evaluation of what things cost and what you're getting from them. And what the risk is. And what the risk is, exactly right. Because how many, I mean, we've heard these four incidents and, and then the latest, which was actually at the level two lab. Uh, how many are there? I mean, if you've got 1,600 labs, that, by the way, that doesn't mean 1,600 separate buildings, right, right as the chairman said. These right. are, you could have multiple labs in the same center. Can correct? be, but nobody knows how many there are. Do, do each, do, does each agency that has labs know how many labs that they have? Does HHS know how many labs they have? Does USDA know how many labs yeah. they have? The federal agencies probably do, yes. So, the, so somebody knows, agent, silo by silo, agency by agency, what labs they have. Which ones have been built by the federal government. But these labs are being built by state governments. They're being uh, built in the private sector. Uh, they're being built um, by other than the federal uh, and so if I wanted to go out and build a lab and deal with these agents at level three or four, can I, can I just go do that and not if tell they, anybody? You can't do it and not tell anybody if they're on the select agent list. That law is clear. If they are not on the select agent list, then yes, you can. All you have to do is get the money from it for it. For and, and the select agent list is the one that has the worst of the worst, right? Most of the worst of the worst. Okay, so that raises the issue then, should other agents be put, who puts, who gathers up the select agent list? CDC and the Department of Agriculture, separately for human pathogens and plant and animal pathogens. All right, and, and you said you thought there were too many labs at 1,600. We said we don't know whether there are too many, whether there are too few. Oh, I thought Study, you said no, earlier today that you no, thought there were too many. In no, your I, very, I very carefully said we need to do an evaluation, we need to find out what, how many are really out there. Right. We need to look at the national strategy, the current uh, consideration of the bio threat, right. and decide whether that amount of capacity is less than we need, the same of what we need, and so we got it right by guess, or more than what we need. And if I were a betting person, my bet would be on more. More, we have more labs than we need? There's a very, very large capacity to do this kind of work. And without looking again at the threat and without looking again at how much we right. really need in comparison, at least at the federal level, to the other needs facing our nation today, I think that's, that's a very important analysis that should be done. Okay. But you haven't done that analysis. No. So that's just a personal opinion. It would not be. It, would, it is our view that the analysis should be done. It is, would not be appropriate for GAO to do it. 
GAO would argue Understood. that the executive decision. branch uh, has the responsibility for doing that. All right. And, and would it be helpful? I, I assume when these other reports come out or are finalized by the administ Obama administration, that you all will take a look at those in the context of going forward or not? We'll, we'll be very interested in looking at them, at them uh, in the context of some of our other ongoing work, or if this committee, would, a subcommittee, would like to ask us to do that, we can do that as well. Wouldn't that round out your report? It, it might. It, it, it might. might. Okay. Thank you. My time's expired. Mr. Green for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you and the ranking member asked uh, some of the best questions, and why don't we have some type of mandatory um, certification, whether it's built by state government or private entity? Uh, uh, Dr. Atlas, um, is there any reason you can think of of not having some registration between these federal agencies that oversee it? I think the, the only issue from the community is the question of overregulation. Um, a registration per se without um, requirements for performance doesn't get you very far. When you begin to impose inspections and other performance requirements, the question of are they really helping you in terms of improving safety or security or are they paperwork and then well, but when you're talking about a BSL-3 or 4 lab uh, regulation and inspection on an annual basis, doesn't seem like it would be too and, – and some standards, I would hope, whether they're state-owned or privately owned, they would have their own safety standards that would be uh, common between, uh, you know, these companies and state governments or even the federal government. Yeah. And for the most part, I think that's true, and certainly when we're dealing with the select agents, there is a regular and sometimes multiple inspections um, by different agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, for those labs, going back to the early question, the government knows exactly where they are. They know which agents are there. They know their performance requirements. They, they have copies of all their manuals of operating procedures. Um, it's the other naturally occurring agents, whether it be the current influenza virus that's circulating or um, SARS when it broke out that, that was put into a laboratory, uh, where we're not seeing uh, the same oversight that we see for the select agents. Okay. And I agree with you. We don't want to stop the research because I agree with H1N1 that, you know, we couldn't be on where we're at now with the development without lots of different folks looking at it and different, uh, not only non, you know, government agencies, but non-government. But it just seems like the, between the Department of Ag and, uh, you know, NIH or, or FDA, we could have a, a memorandum of understanding so they would have the same standards and they would split up the requirements, but they would have common standards for the benefit of the land. there is certainly coordination between Ag and HHS uh, on many of these um, issues. I think what the ASM has proposed is that we uh, have a full study of cost and benefit of moving towards standards, figure out what those standards would be, and then see whether or not it's appropriate to institute an accreditation system across all the high containment labs. Uh, we're not ready to sort of jump off the bridge and say mandate that until we understand the cost benefits and what we would be looking at, but we think that that sort of study and examination ought to be done done now. Um, perhaps we've made that recommendation before both the executive uh, order working group and transfederal task force. I don't know whether or not that that's been accepted and whether that will move forward. Dr. Kingsbury, and uh, in your testimony, you talked about the decreasing budgets, particularly uh, for the agencies. And yet, with the proliferation of the number of BSL-3 labs, that uh, doubling of BSL-4 and nearly increase of 1,400, and the, are we not seeing these agencies respond because they don't have the funds to develop this coordinated effort? Uh, that's part of the issue, I suspect. Um, it's also behind our concern 
about if you're going to have this many laboratories, you really need to think ahead about how you're going to fund them uh, from a maintenance perspective. Uh, so it's all tied up in the same thing. I think what, what agency officials that we met with told us about this issue of interagency coordination is, is no one agency currently believes that it has the authority to direct another agency to do anything about the labs it funds. And so each agency may know what they have, but nobody, and one of the reasons we directed some of our recommendations to the National Security Council and the National Intelligence Council is that it would take something at that level, at the White House level, to figure out what needs to be done to give a single entity sufficient authority to do the kinds of things we're talking about here. So you don't think you would need legislation? Uh, it could actually be done under current regulations? I'm not sure whether we need legislation or not frankly. Okay. I th I'm looking forward to these reports that uh, we've been talking about because we have some expectation that that issue may be taken up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm out of time. Mr. Gingry, uh, questions, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize to our witnesses, Dr. Kingsbury and Dr. Atlas, for uh, being late. I had a press conference, and uh, but I'm glad I didn't miss this. I know it's a very important hearing Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you holding it. Uh, Dr. Atlas, let me ask you this. You referenced the need uh, for careful consideration of recommendations regarding new requirements for biosafety and biosecurity in uh, laboratories uh, in light of the very careful equilibrium that currently exists to oversee and manage research activities. And you, you also state that uh, excessive policy changes could upset the delicate balance. Dr. Alice, uh, what could be the impact on our scientific community if we were to pursue a policy, certain changes that did upset that delicate balance? What would be the consequences of that? The consequence would be that the patient would be less safe. If we don't carry out the research that we need on infectious disease, if we have scientists abandoning work on pathogens to, to work in other areas, uh, then, in fact, we're not going to have the vaccines we need. We're not going to have the therapeutic drugs, and we're going to see that we cannot contain outbreaks of disease. Um, if you went to an extreme, you just wouldn't have a vaccine for H1N1 coming in a few weeks. So we need to ensure that we're not having a burden on the community that causes scientists to say, I'm going to go work elsewhere. Um, and, you know, that's the call for careful evaluation. It's not a call for no regulation, no oversight, quite the opposite. It, it is a call for carefully considered appropriate regulation and oversight. Um, what, you know, one doesn't want is a knee-jerk reaction that says, oh, my God, we have to do something. Let's do it today without thinking through the consequences. But once you have brought input from the community with the leadership of HHS and USDA. The ASM thinks we can move ahead and continuously improving the system and that we need to have that done on a regular basis. It's not a yeah. one-time affair. Dr. Adams, thank you, and I appreciate it. I want to use my remaining time to also uh, ask uh, Dr. Kingsbury a very important question as well. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Dr. Kingsbury, two government reports were recently completed uh, that deal with the subject of strengthening and oversight of biosecurity in the United States. One completed by the executive working group and, in fact, sent to the president in July. The other, I understand, just completed by the Transfederal Task Force on uh, optimizing <clears throat> biosafety and biocontainment oversight, which is chaired by HHS and USDA, as you know. Given the subject matters of these yet-to-be-released reports, I am wondering whether you think this hearing might have been better served or could be better served with these reports available for us to consider. Um, might may be a good word, but we don't substitute our judge for judgment for the committee chairman on about what, when they want to have a hearing. So You're, I'm not really asking you to, uh, to second-guess the chairman. I, I just ask you your opinion in regard to these well, reports. I'm here to report on our work, sir, not my personal opinions. Okay, well, I, thank you very much, and I'll ask Dr. Atlas the same question then my remaining time. And I think the answer is we would be happy to meet with your staff or the committee again once those reports are issued to continue our dialogue. 
Well, I, and we just talked re recently, you know, a few minutes ago, about the possibility of the chairman asking us to look at those reports and, and give, give him our views. Certainly. Well, uh, again, let me just say that I think it is important that we, uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe I would suggest that uh, you strongly consider having uh, a hearing, another hearing, once those reports are released in light of this hearing today. And uh, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back my time, and I thank both witnesses for the response. Thanks, Mr. Kingry. Uh, Mr. Burgess, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being late. Um, Mr. Chairman, I guess the question may have already been asked to you, uh, and we can discuss this afterwards. I, I don't understand why we don't have someone from Department of Homeland Security here on the panel. Um, now, Department of Homeland Security recently selected Kansas as the site for the new uh, foot and mouth disease facility. Are level four labs, and I'll ask this to both of our witnesses, are, are level four labs appropriate for inland research for diseases such as foot and mouth disease? And wouldn't it have been better to hold the hearing before we held the vote? You don't have to answer the second part. But uh, uh, is, it, is an inland facility appropriate for this uh, monitoring and research on, on well, we did issue a very contagious course. illness? Because 40%, 45% of the nation's cattle traverse the state of Kansas at some time in their, their lives? It was a very large number in a recent uh, resolution discussion in the House about that. Um, we issued a report recently that looked at the question, not asking our opinion per se, about whether uh, it's appropriate to put a facility on the mainland as opposed to an island, but rather looking at the evidence that the Department of Homeland Security put forth in making that decision and concluding, as they clearly did conclude, that there is no risk of doing foot and mouth disease uh, research on the mainland, or essentially no risk. Um, the, the facility that is being talked about is going to do more than foot and mouth disease. But the thing that has continued to concern us is that, in, that A, foot and mouth disease is the most infectious virus on the planet, and B, uh, the research on that requires research with a lot of very large animals. And so the whole design and operational structure of that facility in the, on the mainland where cows are in the neighborhood has not yet been laid out in a way that we would conclude and our experts would conclude uh, has demonstrated that it's safe to do foot and mouth disease research in particular in that facility. When, uh, when do you expect that we will have the availability of that information? Or will this just be information that's gained along the way after the facility opens? Well, the, the um, uh, Kansas State University folks and the people who are putting that facility where they have selected to put it in the Department of, of Homeland Security will have to develop a design for the building. They'll have to develop operating pr protocols. They'll have to de develop all of the things about how you would contain an outbreak if it did get out and so forth. And those are the things that aren't developed yet, but hopefully would be developed before any of that virus actually enters the building. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe a good word there as well. Uh, Dr. Atlas, do you have uh, anything to add to that? I think that one can design and operate a uh, BSO-4 agricultural facility safely. Um, as to the exact location, the risks, I'll leave that to the DHS and the community. But clearly, the Kansas community wanted that facility there and, and fought for that in that location. It was not a matter of their saying, you, you know, the federal government is putting something where we don't want it. It was also clear that Plum Island either needed massive renovation or the facility needed to be relocated to a location where the scientific community would join in the, in the critical research that's needed, um, as was pointed out, not only on foot and mouth disease, but on many of the other agriculturally relevant agents that would be worked on there. Um, so something had to be done to provide an adequate facility, and my contention is that you can build an adequate facility and locate it in an appropriate place. An observation from, uh, from Galveston a year ago, of course, Hurricane Ike uh, ravaged the island, is even today having some difficulty recovering, but a brand new biodefense laboratory that was at that point not occupied, but certainly came through uh, what I would regard as a very serious stress test came through with, with pretty much flying colors. Now, these labs are expensive to build. They're expensive to maintain. Is the funding level for both the 
building and the maintenance, are those funding levels adequate? Uh, is that something that is receiving the appropriate amount of, of scrutiny and the appropriate amount of monitoring? We didn't directly look at what the funding level would be. There's, there's an initial funding uh, being discussed in current appropriations discussions, but what the entire facility will end up costing, I think, I would argue we don't know yet. And then what about the maintenance dollars? I'm, we're we're very worried about the maintenance issue. I mean, the, the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in, in Great Britain mm -hmm. was, was directly tieable to a maintenance issue uh, in a relatively older facility. So as these facilities age, um, it will be very important to continue to, to pay attention to uh, how much maintenance is going to be necessary and to provide the support for doing that. And the fact that that has to go through our annual appropriations process m yeah, means yeah. Means some, there's additional, some additional uncertainty. In a, in a time of very uh, uh, high budget constraints. Sure. And uh, again, Mr. Chairman, I think that's something this committee needs to pay particular attention to as we go through the next several years because, as we've seen from our appropriators before, and I understand the difference between an authorizer and appropriator. You go up to the NIH, all the buildings are named for appropriators. There's none named for an authorizer. I do understand the difference between an authorizer and an appropriator, but it's certainly our job to keep up, uh, keep up the oversight on that. And, and when, as correctly Dr. Kingsbury pointed out, as those budgetary dollars are squeezed, we need to make certain that areas where legitimate functions of government are not compromised. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, a couple questions, if I may. Uh, on page 32, you have table number 10, which shows the 12 federal agencies that um, have BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs, but none of them outside their own agency know how many labs that really exist, BSL-3 or BSL-4, correct? That's correct. All right. You indicated in your test, how many of them of these 12 agencies, I think people would be surprised that even Department of Interior has these labs, um, how many of them have a personnel reliability measurements or, or protections of the 12 agencies. Department of Defense, you said, does any else have a? We don't think so, do we? Uh, Department of Energy. A Department of Energy also? Right. OK, yeah. because the nuclear labs and that like? Within the last year, they have begun to implement a personal reliability program for Just last centers. year? Yes. So of the 12 of agencies, the only one that has a robust one would be Department of Defense, Energy starting, so we got 10 more without any kind of? Measurement, okay. Um, Dr. Atlas, do you think academic and private institutions, uh, do you think they should be registered labs, level four and level three? Do you think they should be registered with the government? And, and I think the question is, what comes with the registration? If you it just means that someone should send you a note that says, we have a laboratory, and, and it doesn't bring anything else about. I don't see much value, but there's also very little burden, so you're not going to get resistance to that. I think the sense is if you're going to register the labs, you ought to be asking additional questions, and that's where the devil will be in the details about what it means to register um, and potentially be accredited at the end of the day. Um, so I, I do see a value in a system that ensures increased biosafety, um, that reassures this committee and the public at large that what's going on in the laboratories is being appropriately done. Um, I, but we don't know what's going on in laboratories unless they tell us, right? And if you're one of these select agents, you, you're level three or you're level four, so why, why would there be a reluctance in the register with the government, the labs? I think, first of all, for the select agents, they are registered. I mean, everybody has to go through a clearance process. The government knows exactly where those laboratories are and everything that's going on in those laboratories. If you talk about uh, laboratories which might be isolating a new and emerging infectious disease organism, um, there are questions about how quickly and who you would tell and what you're doing, particularly in the private sector. And you well, let's say I'm a level three lab. I'm not doing a non-select agency. Shouldn't, shouldn't I still register with the government? And one of the questions we've been going around here this morning is how many labs do we need if we have 
2,600 level three labs? Do we need 2,600? Well, I, I think it, it would go back to the question, how many of these are coming from government funding? That is, how much of, is the government investing versus someone sees an opportunity to develop a vaccine, is willing to invest in that vaccine or therapeutic drug development, of which we have a real problem getting people to invest. But if companies see that and they build a laboratory to safely perform the work to develop a new vaccine against influenza virus, um, they ought to be able to do that, I would argue. That, that is part of uh, the entrepreneurship of this country. Now, should they have to do it safely? Absolutely. Sure, but if it's one of the criticism been we've thrown a lot of money at this issue since 2002. If there's a lot of BSL-3 labs out there that could do the work, why would the government build more BSL-3 labs? Because we don't know they don't exist if, if we're not registered. I guess that's the part I'm trying to get at. And I'm uh, not convinced that the government is spending a lot on building new laboratories. That was not, as I saw it, part of the GAO report was actually the dollars going into um, the labs. It was uh, charts that showed an increase in the number of registered laboratories which may represent uh, academic and private sector as well as the public. Yeah, we don't know. We really don't know how many there are. But even you point out in, in your testimony on that that the real expense is not just building but the maintaining because the high level of sophistication you may, may need to maintain a level three or level going four. Going back to the earlier question, that is where the ASM would also register concern is that we right. have to be vigilant about ensuring maintenance. Well, let me ask you this, then. You make a number of recommendations, about seven of them, I think, here today, and in the letter you sent in 2007, you had, I mean, yeah, 2007, you had a number of them. And a lot of them probably would not require federal rules or laws, uh, such as increased trading or reporting of incidents, but has your ASM membership, have you taken it upon yourself to do this without government regulation or government lead here in reporting incidents, doing training? You mentioned training. Um, why doesn't your organization do it instead of having government mandates? I think we look to the CDC and NIH to, in fact, take the leadership role in guiding the community uh, in this regard. That They are the uh, primary authors, along with USDA, of the BMBL, um, and the ASM is seeking increased input into that uh, process. Uh, but in terms of developing a responsible culture of reporting incidents, um, that I think needs to be within a government um, function. Okay, I'm just a little surprised you're a scientist. I would think you'd want to take the lead here and develop the, without government intervention or telling you I, how I to think do it. That where ASM comes from would be working with government okay. to, in fact, see that a system is implemented, not trying to undermine um, or circumvent um, what properly would be a, a role of public health. Okay. Mr. Walden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Atlas, I sure appreciate your uh, testimony and comments today, uh, especially when you said that you, know, you wouldn't necessarily want the government deciding somebody couldn't open a lab to, uh, to go, you know, figure out the new and latest vaccine. I, I don't want a government complete takeover of this whole process. What I want is to make sure those labs are safe and secure. And I think it makes sense that we kind of know what's out there and where they are. And I, I appreciate your testimony, too, when you talk about just sending in a note and saying, I'm a lab and I'm here, doesn't really accomplish the goals of safety and security. And so I, I appreciate uh, what, what you've had to say today. You, you also had some really, I thought, good recommendations uh, that you shared with us, and I understand also shared with the, uh, the, the Trans Federal Task Force and the Executive Working Group. How were those recommendations received by those two organizations? Well, we're waiting to see the report, which we have not seen. Um, they certainly had broad input not only from ASM, but many mm -hmm. other organizations um, shared viewpoints with both of those groups. They held public hearings. We attended those. There the was broad input. And now we, like you, wait for the uh, outcomes of that. And and I appreciate it. We'll look forward to their response. My understanding is there are 242 entities doing this type of research that are, that are registered, which then among those entities constitute the 1,362 laboratories. 
So in a given university setting or, or whatever, there, we could be sending federal tax dollars in to do this research toward H1N1 vaccine or toward anthrax vaccine or whatever uh, we've decided as priorities. That goes into those 242 entities, and within wherever they do their research, there are multiple labs, right? Yes, and, and how they decide to define a lab, which may be that the animal facility may be one laboratory and then – the room where you actually do research outside of the, Could be another. the second lab. Um, I mean, one of the issues pointed out in the GAO report is that we do not have a standard definition for what constitutes a, a lab. laboratory. All right. um, we do have a definition of what an entity is that has to report that they have a right. um, select agent, um, but it has to be a contiguous um, property. So if, if so if, if – let me switch gears for a second. If you were the National Security Council and you were advising the president, who would you pick as the lead agency to uh, oversee this national lab network? I mean, I would see it from a safety perspective and a public health perspective and mm -hmm. turn to HHS. And, and so the ASM has consistently sought the leadership of HHS and USDA – and not supported in prior testimony uh, a DHS oversight of that because we've seen it as a broad public health issue which then does combat pathogens which potentially mm -hmm. are misused, but, but we're looking at the broad emergence of infectious disease. And that would also bring in CDC and their experts into yes, that process CDC, through HHS. The NIH yes. within the HHS context right. is there. Now, ASM did support within the oversight system the involvement of the Department of Justice and the FBI clearance I process see. Yes. for who could enter a select agent lab. So it wasn't saying just put public health in charge when there are security right. concerns, but it did say if at the end of the day we're really concerned with protecting public health and animal health, then the agencies that have experience in those areas ought to be the lead agents. Now, Dr. Kingsbury said that there are long-term maintenance issues, and they are quite concerned about them. Can you, uh, representing those working in these labs, can you talk to us just briefly? I've only got about a minute left in, in terms of those maintenance issues that are out there and what we should or. We saw in the foot and mouth incident in England it does raise the issue of um, maintenance. Of, and certainly what we see in the academic community is you get the money up front for something and they'll let you facilities run down. You never seem at any university I've been associated with. Um, to have an adequate maintenance budget. So you keep deferring your maintenance, and in these facilities you can't afford to do that. There really does need to be adequacy and oversight of maintenance. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony, both of you, today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gengrey, any questions? No, no, Mr. Burgess, any follow-up? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, just ask a general question. I guess to Dr. Kingsbury, but Dr. Atlas, please feel free to weigh in as well. Um, in the, regards to Plum Island, do we have a, a, a ballpark estimate as to what it would cost to do those those upgrades that you alluded to that might be quite costly? Well, first of all, I think you'd, we'd have to recognize that Plum Island has done already spent a lot of money upgrading their current facility. Um, and when they made a, an application, if you will, to be considered in this in this recent uh, decision process, they identified another part of their island where they could build the kind of facility um, that, um, that would need to be built to do the broader range of research. Um, that is, cost, is relatively costly compared to exactly the same building on the mainland because all the materials have to be shipped onto the island. Uh, so uh, DHS has always made that point as one of the reasons that they don't find the Plum Island solution attractive. Uh, but you could build almost the same kind of, of uh, uh, building there. It's just a matter of whether the additional cost is, is prohibitive. Um, there have been expressed concerns about recruiting scientists to work on an island. Um, it's a fairly pleasant 45-minute ferry trip to get there. We've done it. Um, it doesn't, hasn't seemed to be a big deal with respect to um, recruiting enough scientists. That remains to be seen if we were going to try to do that. But we recognize in our report that Plum Island has already invested a great deal in upgrading their current facility. And for a 50-year-old building, it's in pretty good shape. 
So just a, a dollar for dollar comparison, Plum Island versus a, an, an inland facility, the cost is about the same, but there's logistic issues that would make the building easier. It costs money. But then there are also security issues that will cost money at an inland facility that are perhaps not calculated in this equation. That's correct, and they did not, uh, DHS did not take that cost and those designs into account in making their decision. Now, just going back to Mr. Walden's point for a moment about the uh, HHS ultimately being the one who has the, the supervisory role, does there, does there need to be an entity that oversees HHS on that because of the security the security concerns that exist that, I, that Mr. Walden was bringing up. I, hate, I hesitate to use the word czar, but does there need to be a bio czar that is looking at this uh, yeah. from a, from, more from a security standpoint? We've, no more czars. Yeah. We've focused most of our work on the biosafety side of these issues, not the biosecurity side. Uh, some of our colleagues testified this morning on a physical security um, examination that they did of several of the BSL-4 laboratories. Uh, the, the problem there is what is the actual threat and what, what is the experience that has happened over the past years of anybody breaking into a lab. And we're not aware of any uh, incidents that would suggest that sec physical security upgrades may or may not be needed. On, on visiting the lab in uh, the new lab in Galveston, I, I was impressed with the security. Um, Always, of course, you do have to ask yourself, what is the, what is the threat from an internal disruption or, or, or someone who's, uh, who's working in the facility who then decides to take a different, uh, different approach to their, to their employment? So what do we have available to, uh, to help us with that? Well, that's what a personal, a personal um, uh, reliability program would help with. But again, even in that case, there has been only one alleged case of an insider doing illegal things in the way that we all worry about. And so I think to study it and to, to think about how you're going to invest the taxpayer's money, looking at the question from a somewhat broader context really is important, including how much, how much of this research capacity do we need. We've built a lot of it, as we've been talking about through this whole hearing. There's a lot of young scientists out there getting very interested in these kinds of, of jobs what happens if the funding for supporting that research dries up? Where are those scientists going to go with the skills that could make them insider threats mm. if they were to get upset? So those are the kinds of issues that we think need to be studied in evaluating the national need here in comparison to other national needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kingsbury. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Let me just ask a question here, uh, Mr. Burgess, Mr. Henry brought up Plum Island. Now, both you and Dr. Sharma did the report, uh, GAO report, on moving the foot and mouth disease off Plum Island to the mainland, right? That's correct. And if I remember correctly, GAO did not conclude that the DHS study showed that foot and mouth disease can be done safely on the mainland. That's correct. I'm not going to take, right. uh, take a case of Dr. Atlas's uh, uh, belief and that it could be done, but the evidence that we, we were given in the environmental impact statements and so forth do not demonstrate that point. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I'd just ask unanimous consent that my opening statement can be inserted at the record. We've done it earlier, but fine. <laughs> so it'll be entered. I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony. I want to be sure that GAO continues its oversight of domestic and international lab proliferation. Dr. Kingsbury, would your team, you've done good work, and I'd ask that the GO review the two reports, which will hopefully be out in the next few weeks. Uh, around here, they always say a few weeks. That usually means a few months. Uh, the one being Trans-Federal Task Force for Optimizing Biosafety and Biocontainment Oversight and the Executive Order Working Group on Strengthening the Biosecurity of the United States. This subcommittee would be interested in the proposal set forth in these two reports. We are asking that GAO assess any recommendations set forth in those reports and report back to us with your assessment. Uh, will you do that for us? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Well, thank you. And that concludes our hearing. Yes. Members will have. Yes. Can, can I just ask sure. you while we're together here? Uh, just two questions. One, we had asked um, you and the, the uh, uh, Chairman Waxman about the opportunity to do an oversight hearing and, and invite up the uh, auto czar in the White House. We haven't gotten a response to that letter from the end of June. I just wonder if you could. There have been a number of conversations going back and forth. I think uh, the progress. 28th is the end of the program. Um, and speaking with some of the interest groups, they said, wait until we get the program done and let's see what went wrong, what went right with it. So there's so still, we may get there's still some that. interest in doing one, yes. Okay. And the other issue involves uh, insurance. I know that uh, you and Mr. Waxman sent a letter to 52 heads of insurance companies asking Correct. for their financial information. I just wondered if, if we're any closer in knowing when we might have a hearing involving that issue. Uh, we're kicking around some calendar dates. As you know, the uh, majority of leaders just given – us some dates back, if you will, right. some Fridays. Uh, there's been some discussions. If we're here on a Thursday, can we do a Friday morning hearing to get some of them done? We'd like to have some hearings, not just on the insurance industry, but also what is the effect has been on small businesses and cost of health insurance. I look forward to spending the next month and doing some hearings on insurance. I know we all have an interest in that. So in we'll the next 30 days, we may have yes, multiple I, I think hearings on these issues? We would like to. We'd like to. It's just uh, how does the information come in and and, and, and where we're going with it. Will we be looking at other um, contributors to that cost equation other than just the executive comp on insurance companies? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're looking at, at what's the cost of small businesses, what's the uh, – if you have some examples, we'd be happy to hear it. I just received one yesterday, about 30 percent increase for a small business. Uh, uh, well, I was a small business yeah. for 22 years. I never could throw the dart high enough <laughs> on the budget planning board. Well, those are things we're looking at. We're not trying – you know – is the increase, that 30 percent increase, is going into health care or is it going into other objects? That's what we want to know. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if, yes. along that same line, if I could ask you and the ranking member, has that information that, uh, that was gathered from, from those companies, has that been – has the majority staff shared that with the minority staff? Yes. Everything we have, we haven't uh, Everything – we haven't received everything from every request we've made, but the – Information we have received, minority class, my, my, my minority, minority staff. staff, and they are class, minority staff has had uh, access to it, and it will continue to okay. have access to it. Thanks. If we get something in there, have access to it. Okay, committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record, so if there's any more questions, we'll get them to the appropriate party. That concludes our hearing. The meeting of the subdivision, the meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned.